Oh, it's time. Time to get radical. Your discretion is advised. Welcome to Radical Comedy of the Week for April 12th through the 18th, 2021. These are the very best comments from that time period. Starting out with the honorable mentions, we got Dumez, Martyville, and John Russell. The bronze medal comes to us from Destroyer of Heroes. This comes up all the time, and it's something that we will never all fully agree on because we all have our own personal preferences and pet peeves. I think most of us do feel that this system of asking your audience for money is a broken system. If e-beggars themselves can't even decide if it's a donation, a service, or a tip, this whole gray area is what makes this such a topic of debate. Then there's the problem of Patreon not functioning like an actual service, as it doesn't have a system of checks and balances where it punishes YouTubers for not fulfilling their promises on uh, for that f- or just flat out lying to their audience or even the occasional bait and switch. I can totally agree with the idea that some people actually do put in some serious work and do provide a service to viewers. There are clearly some YouTubers out there you could argue do uh, deserve to get paid more than the standard hobby video uh, scam artists like Wood, Eric, and Hancock. Some of these guys can make documentary-style videos and actually invest their own time and money into research, unlike RGT85, who just copy-paste somebody else's story where he rolls out of bed every day at 2 p.m. or later. Some YouTubers review gaming devices and can take them apart and provide detailed technical info on them. Some people really know their stuff, unlike guys like Metal Jesus Rocks, who can't even work the TV remote. But again, I say this. Even for the YouTubers who put in real work and are actually skilled and are qualified, the argument can still be made that Patreon is a busted system. If they are part of that system, they are also part of the problem. This is why so often they are all just lumped together. Patreon as a whole is gross. Yeah, there is a gray area. There definitely is a gray area. Not everyone's going to have the same agreements. Uh, But I feel that it's necessary to sometimes have a conversation around these things. You know, I mean, I spark a conversation around many things, not just around Patreon. You know, I talk about things, you know, pretty much everything. And I'm not always going to agree with everybody. And I don't expect to agree with everybody. And I don't expect everybody that comes here to agree with me. But, you know, I've just seen so much disrespect from some people that will come here and they'll just flat out tell me that there is nothing wrong with Patreon. There's nothing wrong whatsoever. And then I will point them to things like ex-celebrities using Patreon. I mean, you know, five, ten bucks. Why the fuck should anybody give Jamie Kennedy five, ten bucks for uploading, you know, one hobby video a week talking about things? Why? Because he was in Son of the Mask? Now, that's going to trigger a lot of people, you know, fans of Jamie Kennedy, but I don't really give a fuck. You know, you can't come here and answer to me why... Why people should be giving this guy five to ten dollars a month? Like why? You know, I mean, and I want to hear the argument. Well, he's a he's a former celebrity, or he's a celebrity, or whatever. Like, well, that just gives more reason not to, because the fucker, unless he spent all of his money from Malibu's Most Wanted and Son of the Mask, and even then, why should you take pity on somebody that spent all their Hollywood money? Imagine how many people that would give anything to be you know, in his position as he was years ago. But now he's on YouTube with a Patreon, of all things. Because he doesn't feel any shame, I suppose. There needs to be shame for people on YouTube that have Patreon. There needs to be. I wouldn't do it. I would feel bad. You know, there needs to be shame unless you're actually offering fair value to people. Unless you're offering fair value to people. Unless you're actually... I mean, it's not like any of these people that I've seen are offering some fair value to people. And you can't give me the argument that, uh, you know, uploading hobby videos, talking about things is fair value. Thank you, Destroy of Heroes. The silver medal today comes to us from Sean A. I can't stand retro gaming YouTubers that focus on the so-called value of games and retro games in general. I think I followed MGR around 2018 when I was collecting physical games for the PS4 and Xbox One. At some point, I bought Crash Insane Trilogy Remastered, and the whole trilogy was not on the disc. 
At this point, I stopped collecting physical games because in the future, they will be worthless when these companies will go away or shut down servers, the patches, and actual game content will not be around. It's going on right now with the PS3 being shut down. Game patches are disappearing for certain PS3 games, whether they're physical or digital. I chose to buy digital because sometimes it would be cheaper on sales or worry about the trade crap trade-in values. GameStop would give me the uncertain future of patches, the uncertain future of patches for the games. I also buy digital to spike GameStop and give developers more of the profits. I would focus too much on collecting games rather than playing them and buying whatever crap MGR was shilling. Now I see videos on TikTok for people going around Goodwills just scooping up anything video game related and it's actual actually disgusts me because uh, they because they do all they do is say I can get such a for this such a price for this on eBay. So we have people that purposely set high prices on video games and anything video game related because of the influence these retro gaming YouTubers have on the market. I really I really unsubscribed and started to see the evil of channels like his. Also built a computer to emulate mostly anything up to PS3, so I would not have to worry about buying all these games. The price of the Silent Hill games have skyrocketed recently. I'm not going to spend a ton of money or more than the MSRP of the game when it came out when there were millions of copies sold in the U.S. I'm not begrudging anybody that has physical games, but my spirit for actually owning games has withered due to social media's influence on the market and the future of game server patches. That's a crazy thought, you know. I don't know if anybody thought, you know, years ago when they skipped out on buying, you know, Silent Hill 2 or 3 or whatnot, that there would be a day to where, and I don't know the prices, maybe they're in the hundreds, I'm not sure. I haven't, I haven't looked it up. You know, like really video games? Like no one just stops and looks at it and says like, okay, so video games. These are worth hundreds and thousands of video games? Like, you know, video games that had millions of copies, they're not even rare. You know, that's why a lot of people don't like channels like MJR. They don't like this whole thing on YouTube where people are just talking about the value of games, like the physical monetary value. They're not, not talking about, you know, the games just from a perspective like why they're, I mean, not to say that they don't, but so much focus on the value. You know, video game value channels. That's just kind of like, it's kind of sick to me to think about, right? I mean, if you're really into the gaming communities and you actually want to, like, play games. But I guess there's this disconnect between the different communities. You know, there's the buyers, the resellers, you know, the people that look at the aspect of, you know, the money making and the investing in games. And there's always going to be kind of like a disconnect between those two communities. Also, you know, you got the snobs like Path and Espunk that hold their nose up at people that, you know, uh, play ROMs and emulate and all this stuff like that. Now, uh, you talked about the patches, the PS3 patches. I had an upload years back called Coaster Watch. And on principle, you know, I was like, I'm not buying Overwatch. I heard it's a pretty good game, but I'm not buying it, especially not paying full price for it because it's not a physical game. It's not a physical game. And it's just uh, like it was less than the game to me. Well, looking back now, you know, almost like half a decade ago, I'm like, well, this is how things are. You know, the fight between physical and digital was lost. It was. A lot of people fought to keep everything physical, but yeah, there's there's no way to fight against it. Everything's going to be digital. It really is. And right now, the games, you know, that are physical, when you buy them, you still got to download patches. And I'm interested to, interested to see, actually, and maybe a lot of these YouTubers actually kind of see the future of physical game collecting. I wonder what's going to happen when you have a lot of these same YouTubers and they're kind of stuck talking about certain physical games because, well, a lot of these games won't work. You know, we're going to get to that point. We are. And it's 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 a sad thing. Thank you, Sean. Eh? And the shiny, shiny gold medal comes to us from Juliet Julia India Mobile. <clears throat> I'm still shocked. To this day, to see people have a look of pride on their face when they consider YouTube their career. It is as if they've achieved a level of greatness because they can talk about video games and loosely call it employment. They play it up 
as such a great thing. Like they finally made it. Sometimes they try to fancy up what they truly do. It's funny because they live in a false bubble of comfort. In the real world, often people criticize wealthy people for living the good life. Often, when you follow very wealthy people, you realize they're very much entrenched in their endeavors. Often seen for their jet-setter lifestyle, but never taken into account that life is driven by their work affairs. I'll use Elon Musk as an example. This is a man whose true passion is to solve the world's problems no one else wishes to solve. Sometimes he solves problems that make no sense, like boring a tunnel under LA to get from one of his facilities to another because of traffic. Either way, he delivers on his intentions. He's a different kind of beggar in concept. He begs investors for money and seems to have an uncanny knack for making something way overvalued for what it is. Case in point, how Tesla manufacturing was painfully slow start. They can't keep up with demand and won't attempt to, but yet, the company valuation continues to rise dramatically. I've never heard Elon make outlandish demands with his investors or take an idea he got capital for and abandon it because it doesn't have enough personal gain. Nor have I seen or heard him say he was overwhelmed and all these external factors just make it so he can't keep going on and needs a vacation. My point is to show two very radically different types of individual. One who is ultra wealthy and continues to spend a ton of his time increasing slash maintaining his wealth through hard work and perseverance. Compared to the typical full-time YouTube loser who talks about how great it is doing it for a living, gets a Patreon because of ad revenue just isn't enough. He gets a Patreon because ad revenue just isn't enough and the furthers their laziness by spending less and less time doing what their career is, making videos. I can't speak for everyone, but working hard to achieve a personal legacy earned with your efforts and contributions to society seems like a pretty good camp to be in. Or you can be in the lazy leech camp where you work towards near nothing and stay stagnant with the expectation that's the work of others that should carry you. One camp touts its greatness and the other is too busy making things happen to complain or chest thump. You know, a lot of people misconstrue it when I talk about, you know, full-time YouTubers. There's full-time YouTubers out, YouTubers out there that actually can make it happen and they can be honest with their audience and I have nothing against that, you know? It is a viable career for a small percentage of people, but it's better to be employed. It's better to have some education. It just is, you know? Because we don't really know about the future of YouTube, you know? There was a time where people thought, you know, there's never going to be a future to where our games will go away. But you never know really what the future is going to hold. Uh, it's just very important, I think, to kind of get it out there that people should really consider. And when I say it, like people think I'm being mean, but I'm like, no. I mean, if you have to e-bag on Patreon, you know, maybe it's time to get a job. Maybe you should get a job. Like, I really honestly actually do mean that. I don't mean to be like snarky. I'm like... Maybe a lot of you, if it if you need Patreon and high tiers to, you know, if you need to do that, then maybe you should consider just going back to school and getting a job. There's nothing wrong with that. And a lot of these people, uh, a lot of these people on YouTube that live the glamorous lifestyle, uh, someone just left me a link to where Review Tech USA, for instance, just moved back in with his parents. Like he's 40 years old, he moved back in with his parents, basically. You know, so. He's an example of like a YouTuber that I, I just don't. It's not. They want to make it seem like a glamorous lifestyle, but a lot of them are just living on the bubble. A lot of just living on the bubble. You talk about personal legacy. A lot of people have a goal to achieve a personal legacy. You know, maybe Elon Musk wants to do a lot of great things in his life, and you know, on his deathbed, he'll look back and be able to point to a lot of things and say, you know, I did a lot of great for the world. You know. 